I think we can start. Um, we are also recording this, so uh, I think a few more people will join and we're, we'll be posting this up online. Um, but thank you very much for attending this. Um, if those of you who don't know me, my name is Gavin Anderson. Uh, I'm the, one of the founders of Nomadic Skies Expeditions, uh, so the organizer of this event. And, uh, and it's not so much about me, actually, it's mostly about the other people you're seeing on this screen today. Um, but I want to give you a quick introduction to everybody you're seeing. Um, first of all, Lance, um, Lance Richardson, who uh, is joining us from the US. Lance, where, where exactly in the US? Uh, I'm in Providence. It's, it's near, uh, it's about an hour from Boston. Yep, I'll make sure I got that right. Uh, Lance is actually Australian and uh, joined us on the, uh, the expedition to the Crystal Mountain, this whole talk is about. And, uh, and really, the reason we did this is because of, of, of Lance's work, which we're going to hear more about, in writing a biography of the late Peter Matheson, who is probably best known, I think, for his book, The, the Snow Leopards. Um, Lance is a journalist, an author. He's written a, a, a fantastic book uh, called The House of Nutter, The Rebel Tailor of Savile Row. So he's, he's moved from high fashion to high Himalayas, which is quite an interesting shift. Yeah. So uh, Lance is going to tell you more about that, I'm sure. And, uh, and also we have James Appleton. Um, James joined us on a couple of our expeditions and is the most fantastic photographer and filmmaker. Um, there's a short film we're going to try and persuade people to watch in a little bit, uh, which is James Shot, or a short one of the short film of the journey to the Crystal Mountain. Um, really impressive. James is, James is based in the Lake District, but actually, funnily enough, right now, he's about 200 metres away from me. He's in Ullapool, where I am, based in the northwest of Scotland. So, uh, yeah, thanks, James, for joining us. And, no, no, uh, I, came, I came for the weather. Calvin, who hasn't been, Calvin, who hasn't been to, uh, to Dolpo, but is, is soon to go to Dolpo. Cal is an amazing, also an author, also a journalist, travel journalist, and, um, and Carl has written a couple of really fantastic books, one called Thicker Than Water, which I must admit I haven't read, but uh, I'm, I'm, it's definitely on my reading list. But the one I have read that is phenomenal is Islands of Abandonment. And, uh, and I was looking on Carl's website and it's, it's, it's fantastic. She's, she's the winner of the Sunday Times Charlotte Aitken Young Writer of the Year Award. I'm gonna embarrass you now. <laughs> <laughs> And the winner of the, uh, the John Burroughs Medal and shortlisted for the Scottish Nonfiction Book of the Year uh, for the Islands of Abandonment. So uh, it was for the Islands of Abandonment, am I right on that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, and Cal is here to host the discussion that we're going to have after this session. Um, very briefly on myself, um, I do run the Maddox Skies Expeditions, but my background's actually international rural developments and that's what really brought me to this part of Nepal um, to look at the ways in which we could maybe do tourism more inclusively and better with local communities so that's that's uh, the reason why that we are involved in that area working with local communities and we're very lucky that uh, that Lance found us
from how beautiful it was. Yeah. Wonderful. So I hope everyone at home had an opportunity there to review really quite incredible imagery taken there by James, who we'll talk to you in a moment. But first of all, I would like us to begin this session um, talking to Lance. Um, and perhaps you could talk us through um, Peter Matheson's journey, um, your relationship with Peter Matheson as his biographer, and, and why you felt it was important to, to retrace his steps. Sure. Um, so uh, Peter Matheson, a uh, uh, very well-known uh, American um, novelist and a naturalist, and he's one of those people who kind of had his fingers in all the pies and did did lots of things throughout his life. Um, from uh, he started the Paris Review, which a lot of you have probably heard of. Um, he was a CA agent. He was a Zen Buddhist. He did all sorts of things. Um, and what happened is uh, he was friends with uh, a field biologist named George Schaller who is very well known, probably the best field biologist in the world today. He's still around. Um, and George was going to uh, do a series of expeditions in the Himalaya right, right around. He was living in Pakistan at the time. Um, and he, he told Peter about this tre trek that he was going to do in this region of Nepal. Very, very uh, little known about it at that point. It had been closed for a, a very long time because of the situation in Tibet. Um, and it was sort of opening up and he was going to go there and he was going to study the Himalayan blue sheep. Uh, and he asked Peter if Peter wanted to come and Peter said yes for a kind of variety of reasons. It was a little like vague to him why he said yes. He wasn't even sure why he wanted to go so badly, but um, basically his wife had just died and uh, he um, kind of was very interested in escape from his life. He wanted to sort of find what he refers to throughout all his work as an island. He wanted to find sort of a, a, a sort of mythical personal island where he could get away from everything and just be sort of self-sufficient. Um, and that was, that was the main driving factor. But he also at that point had become very interested in Zen Buddhism and he was interested in other types of Buddhism as well. So the idea that he would get to go to a remote monastery that was, uh, you know, under a mountain that's very kind of uh, sort of um, important to Tibetan Buddhists. The crystal, the crystal mountain, um, was was an opportunity that for him was too good to turn down. So, so they went in in the fall of 1973, uh, which actually is 49 years, 50 years last next year, um, and they they started in Pokhara. Um, which is not where we started because when they, 50 years ago, there wasn't any like little planes that could fly into where we went to. So it, it was sort of substantially different and far more uh, rural and less developed than it is today. So they went and it took them, um, gosh, I'd have to check, but I think it took them about two months to get there. It was quite a long trip for a variety of reasons. It was kind of very arduous. Um, and then uh, they got there. Uh, they stayed for a few weeks to do the scientific survey. Peter had... Um, series of, I guess, personal epiphanies while he was there. And then he left and, and over the next five years, he wrote this book called The Snow Leopard, which is very famous today. Um, and the book that introduced me to his work and that made me want to write this biography, if I have moments where I'm wondering why the hell I'm writing this biography and I have many of them, uh, I go back and I revisit that book because I still think it's as spe spectacular as it was the first time I read it. Um, and yeah, I've been working on my biography since 2017. Uh, and uh, my personal relationship to him is, I would say, um, at this point, strained. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you, spend, you spend so much time with your subjects and you get to know them so intimately that um, uh, you end up with a very kind of love-hate relationship with them. And, and, um, and that's where I am. But I wanted to do this trek. Um, it's actually kind of hard to articulate why I wanted to do it. I, I, I was interested in it because that book meant so much to me when I read it and because I knew it was in in Peter's life and his um you know evolution from from where he started to to ending up being a Zen Roshi a very important moment for him and uh initially when I started this project I wanted to write about the landscapes and the animals that he wrote about and to sort of say to sort of write about how they had changed since the days that he wrote about them and um my book has changed somewhat since then and become much more of a, a straightforward biography but um yeah, I just, I wanted to go and I wanted to see how the landscape had changed. And I wanted to get a sense of this place that meant so much to him, because I think that 
um, you know, revisiting the places that people went to and that had a big, infect, a big impact on them, you, you do get insight into who they were and, and what they became in their life. But it's kind of, it's abstract. It's kind of hard to explain why I wanted to go. And the opportunity was there and why not? Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, we've, we've gotten a little bit of a sense of the landscape from watching that brief video there, but can you kind of talk us through what it's like to move through a landscape of that scale and, and perhaps some of the physical challenges that you met during the trek? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny, I came back from, we did this trek and I came back and everyone sort of said, so how was it? And I just didn't really have the words, like, as you will see yourself when you go there in a few weeks time, um, the, the, the scale is kind of beyond words. And, and that's why the snow leopard, I think is so remarkable because it, he captures uh, far better than I can and far better than I think most people could, um, the, the sort of grandeur of that landscape. But it's, it's very, it's the Himalaya, it's just, it's, it's vast and you are a speck and you are moving through, uh, through this, this sort of gargantuan, um, you know, series of mountains. I think what's really interesting about Dolpo is you, you do feel like, you know, the way it's shaped, it's, it's sort of, there's a valley, you, you go up the Suligad Valley and it's, it's very much like a, a gateway or um, kind of a funnel. And the, the deeper you get, the kind of more beautiful it becomes and the sort of more remote it feels. Um, and, you know, when we were walking, we talked a lot about development and the signs of development along the way, but also the lack of development in the sense that because the, the valley is so narrow, they can't get a road up there. Um, so it, it sort of protects it somewhat. Uh, and, and, and yeah, so you, you go up this valley and then you go up a, a very steep, kind of almost like a, the side of a dam. It's sort of holding in this lake. Uh, and and you, you have this extraordinary lake there that's very famous called uh, Fuxundo Lake. Um, and it, it's just, it's, I, I don't even know what to say about it. It's really um, just spectacular as that footage showed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, well, um, Lance, I'm gonna come back to you um, shortly, but um, James, as someone who works in the visual, um, can you talk a little bit about, I suppose, the attraction of traveling to such a place as a filmmaker and, and how you have drawn from your experiences in Dolpo and your own work? Yeah, um, so I've, I've been twice now up to Dolpo, um, both times with Gavin. Um, as a bit of context, Gavin sort of found me, uh, I think it'd be four or five years ago, and, and invited me on, a, on one of his trips back then to come and basically document it and kind of be immersed in that and he was very kind sometimes on gigs you you you, you were given a very specific set of hey you're going to capture this and need that and Gavin's brief was pretty wonderful it was like just just come and be immersed in it and come back with, with whatever you come back and I think he kind of knew I think he knew having been there before many times that the the scale as Lance kind of alludes to the richness of the culture that at first it's not hidden it's very much visible but the layers that once you start meeting people that get pulled back and you see more and more and more is pretty mind-blowing um and you put all that together um you get this incredible place where the mountains are vast the kind of the back to temples seem to go on forever as you get shown more and more ancient relics and it's within all of that it's just this melting pot of amazing visuals um and yeah, the first time I went, it, it, I mean, and this time too, both times, it, 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 it's blown my mind. You, as Lance alludes to, you kind of go up this valley and it just, the scale keeps increasing. You think you've seen something large, you think you feel small, and then you turn another corner and things just get higher or further away or deeper or the colors get more intense. Um, and so, yeah, as a, as a place to go and film, it, it always feels like there's kind of, once you start to feel that you feel like there's always more to discover um and then within the people as i said there like as you get to know people and you spend time with them um their friendliness their warmth their openness to having you know someone put a camera in their face which is not you know for many people isn't a comfortable thing um they're very open to it provided you interact with them in the right way um and it just makes for a wonderful place to go as a filmmaker because it's stunning the people are friendly um, and the depth of everything is, yeah, is vast. Mm, absolutely, because I think that that's one of the, the concentrations of your work is this idea of slower and more meaningful travel. Is is that a reasonable way to put it? Uh, it is now, and it has become through going to Dolpo and through 
you know, basically through what Gavin showed me on the first trip, really. Um, my background is as more of an expedition photographer and I'm used to moving through places really quickly. And actually, uh, probably 90% of what I do is about trying to keep up and document what is a really fast paced travel through an environment. And so this was a complete reversal of that role um, and a really refreshing one. Uh, and what it highlighted to me and what's become a real focus for me now was how much more that opened up the place to you when you were interacting with it, that there'd been times where I, I, I still sometimes think, where have I been now that if we had been moving slower, that I already thought was incredible would have been even more so because you'd have had more time to interact with locals and, and get some of the wisdom and see some of the culture that when you're moving at a top speed through somewhere, you definitely miss. Um, but yeah, it was Dolpo that sort of really spun that for me and it's made me travel differently. It's made me see things differently. It's made me film differently. So if you want a, a measure of the profound effect that it can have on someone, I think it's had a pretty huge effect on most aspects of what I do. I mean, I still do that work. Um, but I've definitely come to sort of see the value that can be had in on both sides that for the people traveling, you get a better experience through slowing down and then the people that you're actually visiting as well. I mean, it works both ways and the benefits they get to are, are massive. And that all came from from this region and from from being affected by it in that way. Mm, mm, absolutely. And uh, on return uh, to the area, this being your second trip. Um, did you find yourself concentrating on on different aspects of, of the landscape or the culture? Uh, much more on people the second time around. I think the first time I went in with my first hat of not rushing around, but like I, I came from a background where I'm more on the landscape, less on the people. It was no, not something I'd ever really sought out before. And then the second time around, it was going in knowing that that was the real treasure trove, was that it wasn't about the beautiful i mean it, it it has this incredible scenery but it wasn't necessarily that wasn't the most amazing thing about it which is ironic because i think 99 percent of the groups going there are pretty much solely focused on well let's go look at the turquoise lake and let's go see some snow-capped peaks and that is stunning but it's the people and what they've got kind of behind behind what you see when you walk past them and you actually their personalities their religion their culture their language their history um so much of that is is there and then the second time round, it was before you know even setting off in the uk it was knowing that was there and having a bit more of a a kind of goal of seeking some of that out and with the new challenge of we at this second trip were headed to shea gompo and that was a whole new setting scenery and we knew there'd be associated characters with that and it was knowing that when i got there it was those guys i wanted to see like sure i wanted to go and you know photograph these temples on the side of cliffs but it was the guys that were in those temples and why they were there and what they had to tell us that was actually the real kind of treasure um and so it kind of yeah it shifted that before we even went out and that was exactly the case when we got there it was amazing when you yeah you, you kind of turned up and all these characters slowly as you spent more time came out of the woodwork and we got to meet um, one of the llamas at shea who was this incredibly smiley colorful character who showed us around the monastery and took us to bits that you would never get to see if you hadn't interacted with him in a way that was focused on wanting to sort of hear his story a little bit more and not just being a, a sort of fast track passer through and gavin asked him that at the end this this wonderful guy how many tourists have stopped to actually talk to you and i think he said something like right i think it was none in 20 years um which says a lot as well so mm. yeah and uh, Gavin, I think that says a lot about nomadic skies too. I mean, what is your relationship with Dolpo? How have you managed to build these um, relationships over time? Well, actually, the, the first time I went to Dolpo was soon after the 2015 earthquake in Nepal, the Gurkha earthquake, as they call it locally. And um, Dolpo was a little bit further than most of Nepal from sort of epicenter. So it hadn't been impacted quite as badly. And uh, the government actually wanted to see if it pushed tourists towards the less damaged areas and asked the organization that I was working with if we would go in and do a survey of the tourism that was happening there. And, and, and what James is talking about is exactly what we saw. And it was quite shocking, actually. It was quite a lot, there was quite a few groups diverting over that area, uh, which isn't that well visited. But when people that were going there a lot of it was fast trekking, where they just weren't interacting at all with the local communities. They were, you know, very long trekking days, arriving late at night, pitching their tents, eating in a kind of little bit of a bubble together, 
and then just moving on. And in fact, you know, we, we met very few tour groups, you know, tourist uh, trekking groups and we were up there, but we did meet one couple um a, do- a, a, a mother and daughter who talked about that the fact that they were just being pushed around the circuit and what i found really shocking was having spent quite a bit of time up there interviewing these trekking groups interviewing the communities and realizing what james is saying the riches of these the cultural the friendliness the people you know you do see fantastic landscapes but james called it a treasure trove of the people they're missing something so substantial and I think it's missing something that can fundamentally change us as travelers as well. You know, getting that understanding of those cultures and the way they see the world, I think is incredibly valuable. And I think, you know, my background, I, I, I work, I've worked for more than 30 years in international developments um, in a number of countries. And so part of the focus that we wanted with Nomadic Skies was to try and also make sure that the trekking benefited communities, because that was the other problem with it. People flew their guides in and they they hired, they bought all their own food in, um, which you still have to do quite often um, um, with us. But, you know, they wouldn't hire local people, particularly from the upper, the upper valleys, and the upper villages. And, um, and that's quite problematic. So what we're actually doing with the Maddox Skies is trying to actually look at ways in which we can do trekking that's actually more inclusive of the local communities, um, both economically, but also in kind of cultural sharing. And that's, uh, that's where our focus is. Mm, absolutely. But I suppose one, one element of that is that it is a time-consuming way of travel. I mean, uh, if we look at Matheson's original journey, he was trekking for two months. I know in your more recent journey, it was about a month on the road. I mean, um, could you talk a little bit about how the route that you took um, differs to, say, the, the average um, faster trek that someone might take through this area of Nepal? Yeah, so what you tend to find is that across the whole of um, the Himalayas, there are defined trekking trails. Um, they're often the trails that take you the fastest and the quickest. And the, and actually, it's one of the great things about going with Lance is there were villages that I was really keen that were already earmarked that I wanted to explore, particularly in the, in the more sort of Hindu areas. But we realised Maston took a different route, which I was always quite confused by, actually about why he took that route. But, you know, you actually cut much higher. The views are much more spectacular. So in terms of going to some of these villages, which back in the day when Matheson was traveling, they were actually on the main trading routes that were happening between Tibet and the, and the, uh, and the Hindu hill areas. But those, interestingly enough, those, the new trekking trails, or the new trail, the new village trails, really, they've, they've, they've altered, you know, within even a fairly short period of 50 years. And those villages have been completely cut off now. So our, 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 our trek actually takes us to villages that people just are not going through at all. We're also, we're also ascending slower, we're ascending more within the villages, and some of the upper villages multiple nights rather than just passing through and having the opportunity to get local people to actually take us to some of the sites. So that's really the way it changes. And we're quite reluctant to start trying to um, do much longer treks, start pushing us back into this faster, you know, this uh, form of trekking. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, Lance, uh, we, we touched on this already, but um, I suppose over the period of time that you've been researching the book and your evolving relationship with, with Peter Mathis and the author. I mean, do you think that that retracing his steps in this way and going to the physical location that he was writing about, that you have gained a, a better understanding of him as a writer? Yeah, I do, because I actually have his journals <clears throat> that he wrote um, while he was on, the, on the, the road. And then I have obviously the Snow Leopard and I have an intermediary draft. So I've got like three steps of his writing. Um, and then also going and seeing what he was writing about uh, in, in some instances, like, uh, you know, we, we were, I, I was thinking the other day, actually, about, we went to a cliffside um, hermitage called the Sakang, and we were sitting in the room and then, and there's pots, there's very old pots on the walls. And then when you read the snow leopard and he goes there and he sits in that room and he describes the pots, uh, there's a very, very good chance they're the exact same pots. Um, so 
uh, that was just a random example, but but to see the landscape that he wrote about, to see his his very early drafts in his his journal, because what Peter would do is, you know, the Snow Leopard is written as a journal. Um, and I think it's easy to just assume that he just basically published his journals, but that's not what he did. They're very, very kind of uh, rewritten and curated and sort of um, mythified a little bit. There's some stuff in there about his personal life that is very, let's say, massaged. Um, it's not, there's no lies in it, but there's certainly some sort of uh, choice omissions. Um, and so, so to be able to kind of see the raw material and the landscape and then see his, you know, his notes to himself and then see the, the first drafts and then see the final drafts. Absolutely. You get, you get a very good um, understanding of how he worked as a writer that I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't gone there myself, especially if I didn't have those journals. So for, for me, you know, it's, it's amazingly useful to be able to see that for sure. Mm -hmm. And, and also, just, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just, uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I said before about his idea of an island and finding a retreat from the world. And, you know, it's, it's an idea that I think everyone can understand the idea of sort of finding, you know, the desert island away from everyone else. And he, he took it very, very seriously. And then to actually go to, to the, the crystal monastery, which is, you know, the, the monastery itself, as you saw in the video, is like out on this little bluff surrounded by this immense valley. And that was in his life, the ultimate island. You know, he was the, he talked about, he was obsessed with simplicity and simplifying himself his whole life. And he felt very complicated. He felt like his situation at home was very complicated. And he, he often said, and he, he, he did a, a talk about 25 years after that track. And he said it was the only time in his life he ever felt truly simple was in that place. And just, just waking up in his tent, going out, looking at the wolves, looking at the blue sheep, um, you know, he, he made a little meditation spot on one of the hills that James tried to find. Uh, and to, to actually go there and be in that space and to kind of see what in his mind was the ultimate sort of paradise, the lost paradise, he had all these words for it. Um, you know, it was such a gift to me as, as, as his biographer and, and to kind of go to that place that meant so much to him. And I get it. Like, I honestly think Shea Gompa is the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. It is, there's something about it. It's, it's, it's um, elemental, it's out on this bluff. So you feel very exposed to the elements. You feel very insignificant. Uh, it's, I, yeah, so it was very important to me, I think. Yes, that, that was, I think, what I was going to ask, this sort of the, the, the personal aspect of it too. I mean, did you feel some kind of transformative experience in the way that Matheson experienced? Well, I felt very sick. I was quite ill when we were there. Uh, I got, I got a, the, the, I think the, um, you know, Gavin is amazingly good at, at making sure that the people he travels with go up uh, incrementally. You know, we, you, you see people that go to these places and they just rush up in the altitude. Uh, and, and we didn't do that. We went up very incrementally. But I still, I still had some, some uh, lung troubles. Um, and so I was quite ill when we were at, um, at Shea. Uh, but it still was just absolutely amazing to be there and is even through that and, and just to be able to kind of walk around in that space I could have spent easily a weeks there I could have I could, I could see I could see how you could give up give up everything and become a monk an aspirant monk and just go live in that hermitage I I, I get it there's an appeal mm, absolutely and uh, James you've uh, been working on on a number of expeditions i mean could you talk a, a little bit more about that um the the more general psychological impact of of traveling in this way and and how it's changed you over the years yeah um good one <laughs> no pressure sorry <laughs> yeah no not at all um i think it's it's changed the kind of um value that i put on where I, you kind of place your time when you go somewhere um, and your whole attitude on the kind of way. Um, and this is something that I want to explore more with more places and it's part of the kind of wider project that I'm working on is this sense of the world's become for a lot of people a kind of checklist exercise of been there, done that, seen it, you know, got the photo or the video or the GoPro selfie to prove it, what's next kind of thing. And it's sort of trial by social media in that sense because the way that we present travel experiences these days seems to have become boiled down to kind of base level of you just need a photo to prove that you were there um the problem with that is that's really easy to get um 
but it doesn't give you anything uh, really anything deeper than that. Um, and I guess I didn't used to fully recognize that. And for me, it was enough to be part of that and to be someone who was happy to go to places and to get those shots. Um, and I would still spend time in certain sort of spots. Like I used to do a lot more landscape, purely landscape work, very much just focused on a place. And I would happily sit for a week um, in one spot to wait for the right light, the right sunset, the right timing of certain things. Um, and I would sort of come away sometimes feeling a bit smug when you'd see the day trips turn up into some of these spots. They'd be there for five minutes and they'd leave. And you think, well, you don't really know this place. I've been here for a week. I know the little side route that goes down the canyon there, or this is the back point to this waterfall that no one else has found because they've just come and gone. Um, but fundamentally for me, it was still about that kind of sharing of something. And I never really thought about the wider impacts of that. Um, and it was definitely, yeah, I mean, this first time when we went to hear from the, the people themselves that live there, that that is actually quite damaging. And it also then brings into question whether those places will continue to exist. Um, and in some ways it feels quite similar to I'm not going to say not in kind of like a purely comparative way to like, you know, the climate crisis or the loss of biodiversity is there's a risk at the moment of the loss of culture. And I think that people going to these places and the way that we've started to travel has the potential to accelerate that loss at, at the gain of social media likes or follows or that, or that sort of thing. And I think we can also on the flip side, by turning it around, we can do a lot to preserve it and to make sure that those places that have their own reasons why it's not that tourism is the be all and end all um, of potential destruction to these sites far from it in many ways it's a real economic boost to these areas um, but if it's done better it could be an actual like a real lifeline on top of other things where traditional forms of making a living have faded away I mean Gavin alluded to the fact that the, the villages that we went through higher up in the valley used to be on the trading route. They're not anymore because that trading route doesn't exist. Um, and they are now in many ways utterly forgotten because there's no tourism going to them. There's no trade going to them. There's kind of no reason really for the people that live there to be there other than the fact that their families have lived there for probably thousands of years. Um, and I think if things continue the way they are, the risk is that, that those places won't be viable for these people to live in anymore. And I think tourism can be part of changing that. And so these days for me now, it's much more a case of trying to be more conscious of where we're going and how that interaction can be mutually beneficial so that it's not just me coming back, being able to tell people oh, I went here and it was really exciting. And that that part of my life, I'd like to think from a small ego part is, is less important to me now than it was when maybe I was in my early 20s and seeking to conquer the world. It's now more about realising our place in the kind of grander scheme of like, how can we make this work for everybody and also fundamentally understanding that if we want to go there and to still have people there at all we definitely have to interact with them in a way that encourages them to want to maintain their communities there and we have to help them where we can because if we don't and we're part of their destruction we've got no right to turn up in 30 or 40 years time and complain that there are no facilities or or nothing happening or no one there to talk to because we never showed any interest in the culture that was clinging on for existence when we were walking past to look at this turquoise lake I hope that doesn't sound too negative, <laughs> but um, but yeah, no. that's kind of the sort of shift, and it definitely is is quite a profound one, and it definitely started in Dolpo, um, just through that that conversation with people um, that you you don't get if you just turn up looking for that proof of existence in a in a spot, um, to then go home and show people at home. It, it it I think it's got to go back to that idea of travel being a chance to learn, a chance to kind of educate yourself to find out more about the wider world not just to see it and to prove that you've seen it it's it's about and that in many ways is exactly what peter was doing when he was there you know we talk about the the length of time that we spent in Syria, and in many ways peter's stay at shea gompel was kind of lengthened by the fact that george shallow was desperate to find out more about these sheep and so peter was kind of forced into this meditation spending lots of time with himself whilst george was off looking for blue sheep but as part of that, he ended up meeting again some of the characters that on first meeting he sort of breezed past and he got to really understand the place. And I'm not surprised as a result that it had such an impact on him because in many ways he was traveling probably more slowly than even he would maybe be used to through an area. And it, it clearly got under his skin. Um, and part of that's Dolpo and part of that's probably the, the, the speed at which he was moving.
Mm, mm, absolutely. But um, well, maybe Gavin, that brings me to another question I'm interested in, which is um, we we've learned quite a lot about how Dopo affected um, Peter uh, Peter Matheson, but. How did Peter Matheson, and in particular the book *The Snow Leopard*, impact Dolpo? Interesting, because I, I would say, from everything I know, that *Snow Leopard* was the first uh, international book that brought Dolpo to attention, and uh, people still talk about it today. You, you find actually when you go places and you discuss. You discuss Dolpo, it's one of the first things people say. They recognize the name and they, they, they know the book, particularly people of a certain generation. Um, and I think so, it has, I think, impacted uh, significantly. And I think some of the interest that's been generated for the Dolpo region comes through the snow leopards. Um, what I have to say, you know, it was interesting when Lance came to. Well, an email dropped in my inbox from Lance, and Lance said that he was he was doing this journey, and I think my first response to Lance was, um, "I'd be very keen to support you," but realise I have some reservations about uh, Peter Matheson's book, and um, and Lance said, "Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more." And my my reservation actually was the way that the people are portrayed within within the Snow Leopards, and you know one of the things that I really felt was a great opportunity in bringing Lance up was to also give a platform for the local story to come out a little bit stronger in, uh, in, in the biography. I think, you know, Lance helped me to understand actually in very many ways about why Matheson did write in the way he did. You know, the expedition wasn't Matheson's expedition. It was George Shallow's expedition. He was a naturalist. You know, he had, a, he had you know, in very many ways, he had a goal, you know, he wanted to get up the Crystal Mountain to study the blue sheep. So, you know, the, the people along the way, I think for somebody like, like George Shallow, maybe weren't of that much interest. And in a way, you know, they were expecting quite a lot of support from local people to portraying. And when suddenly they found people less than willing to actually drop what is a very hard life that they're struggling with, particularly at the time of year when he came, and they're about to migrate down the valleys and people weren't willing to, to act as porters to them. It actually also goes slightly against the culture of Dolpo where they're not actually, they tend to be more using pack animals rather than carrying goods themselves. Um, you know, the, he, he obviously, there were some parts of the book where he responded quite angrily towards that. So I thought it was a great opportunity to also address slightly the balance in that book. Um, so yeah, it brought the slow leopard. I think has brought many um, benefits to the community, but I think, I think some respects, I think it's felt it's slightly misrepresented the people. Of hmm. And how would you say that the, I suppose, the socioeconomic situation in Dolpo has changed since 1973? It's changed. It's changed massively. Um, <laughs> The, the way in which people survived and sort of the role that people of the, those high Himalayan valleys played was it was a it, they were trading communities they were trading um, so a kind of cyclical trade they were going up to the Tibetan plateau with grain from the from the hill areas and they were trading that for rock salts bringing the rock salts back down to then uh, to then barter in the hill areas. Um, for grain and a kind of, and then they would keep some of the grain for themselves because at those high altitudes, um, um, rice and, and other grains don't grow. Um, so they were very much reliant on that. When the, the political situation, the economic situation changed, one part being the annexation of, of Tibet um, by the Chinese, uh, which caused obviously issues of cross border trade. But probably even more so, some of the other social economic developments have happened, like roads coming into the into the hill areas. And now you actually find the iodized salt, very cheap iodized salt is coming in. So the, the demand for salt has massively diminished. So there is still people who take yaks into Tibet when they can. But at the moment, obviously, the, the Chinese border is closed. Um, but, they, but they wouldn't be taking back rock salt. They'd actually be taking back... Chinese goods to do a little bit of bartering, but 
the margins and the ability to make a living through that have been reduced massively. So it's really changed those communities um, to a point where they're really reliant much more on farming. And there's another, there's another, um, there's, a, there's something called Yasa Gumba, which is a very strange um, caterpillar that's, um, that's been infected by a fungus. It's quite an interesting, uh, and it's recognized in a lot of Tibetan and Chinese medicine as, as being uh, a sort of wonder medicine and its, uh, its value is absolutely huge. So when we were up there, actually people were gathering um, Yastagumba and that's another way in which they're making incomes. The problem for these communities, as we mentioned previously, is that a, a lot of young people are leaving these valleys. And, you know, there are people around who say, well, that's inevitable, you know, it's a tough life, it's really remote. And that is probably inevitable for quite a few people. But what we're seeing is there are people who would much prefer to stay, young people. We're actually working with some of the young guys, a young guy called Galpo, who made a really, you know, he went to university, he speaks English well, but he made a very conscious choice to stay in his spectacular village of Pungmo to actually start trying to work as a, as a guide. And he still does Yasagumba collection and farming, but he wants to piece an income together to bring his family up because he's been to Kathmandu and Kathmandu has very many positive things, but it's a, it's a sprawling polluted city that's uh, sometimes quite hard to survive in. So it, it's not that all young people want to leave the area if they have more economic opportunity. And that's why going back to something James was saying, I think it's so important that if we're traveling there, our travel has to benefit those communities. We can't be traveling there by just flying in guides from Kathmandu and buying all our food locally, we've got to see how we can actually benefit, um, you know, uh, the local community, be working with the young people of Dolpo to actually start trying to help them to see a future with this very changing economic situation they have. Absolutely. And uh, well, a, a little bit of housekeeping here before I ask my next, next question, um, just to let you know, if you're watching at home and you have any questions, we would love to hear them. Um, we're in webinar mode, which means that you can open up the question in a um, box along the bottom menu. Um, you may need to resize your window to do that and type your questions in there. That means I'll be able to see them and I'll be able to read them aloud to the participants this evening. Um, so have a good think. You can pop those questions in at any time and I'll get to them in just a minute. Um, but Gavin, just before we, we move on to questions from the audience, I wanted to ask you about snow leopards. Um, I know that when we go next month to the Dolpo area, we're going to be in search of snow leopards. Um, Peter Matheson was famously in search of, but did not find his snow leopards. What are the, what's the relationship between those who live in Dolpo and the snow leopards and, the, and how many snow leopards are around now? Well, the one the, the one thing I would never I would never offer people is to see snow leopards. I think the chance of seeing them is 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 pretty remote. Um, but I think what's really fascinating is to explore the habitat of the snow leopard, but also the relationship with the, the mountain communities and the snow leopard. Um, and I think you know this is a this is a fascinating relation because the the people of Dolpo are from the Bon religion. And they, they have a very interesting connection and approach to the natural world. They actually believe that what we would think of as inanimate objects, um, mountains, rocks, they actually have a spirituality. The deities live within these. And the animals of Dolpo, the wild animals of Dolpo are actually the livestock of the deities. And therefore they should really be protected. And it's really fascinating because the Local people have that embedded in their culture, a culture of conservation of wild. But at the same time, the snow leopards interact with people. They predate on the livestock. There is sometimes, occasionally, people who harass. Um, in some areas of, of High Himalaya in Nepal, there has been uh, you know, the um, drugging of uh, the snow leopards, killing them as well. Um, so it's an interesting, very interesting relationship. When we, when we speak to the local community, they actually have, even though they are often losing um, goats and young yaks, livestock to snow leopards, they actually have a great respect. So I remember in the fantastic village of Rike, 
meeting someone and he'd only he'd only lost last the week before lost three um goats and uh we asked him what he really felt about it and he said well you know losing three goats is really tough it's it's it, it, it's impacted me very badly but then again when i take my goats to those high mountains i'm really um almost like a tenant in their in their house <laughs> <laughs> so you know i have to expect sometimes to lose some of my livestock so it's really interesting when people talk about this their relationships with it and there's some really interesting modern you know developments happening um galpa who we mentioned you know who works is this young um guide in the in the high villages you know he he, he is supporting a insurance scheme where the local people actually get compensation when they do lose livestock. So there's, there's the beginnings of those sort of conservation efforts to sort of help with that. But I think what's also fascinating there as well is the, is, is the relationship in the national parks and the local communities, because what we hear quite a bit from both the village people, but the religious people, is that there hasn't been an awful lot of understanding or building on that culture that they have embedded within their culture conservation it's been this sort of imposed set of rules and uh, the national park comes in and almost threatens people and sort of tells them if they do this wrong they will get arrested if they do rather than actually working with the elders and the religious leaders to actually promote this you know um which i would maybe suggest is almost a slightly colonial approach to you know the the whole um national park and conservation um, so it is really fascinating, and that's what we will actually be exploring, this relationship between the communities, the spirituality, the snow leopard, this understanding of the way in which people perceive the natural world. And, uh, mm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, just a quick reminder for those watching, if you'd like to pop a question into the Q&A, do pop it in. You can see that by possibly expanding your screen, uh, your Zoom screen, and looking for the Q&A option along the bottom of the menu. Um, Lance, um, perhaps to, to sort of loop back to Snow Leopard, the book, um, I think you're in, in quite a good position to comment on its status, I suppose, as a work of literature. What do you think it was about that book that, that caught people's attention so um, so I, I think there's a there's a few things, and um, when it came out in the '70s, that that was a particular moment of um, spiritual yearning. I think people were looking for things to believe in at that point, and this book comes along that is all about that, and is all about um, somebody who had a, a very familiar pathway to to that. He he'd done the whole LSD thing that I think a lot of people at that time had had you know tried themselves or were familiar with. Um, so I think, you know, as a spiritual memoir, it, it appealed to a lot of people. Um, and also just, just the beauty of the writing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really just a spectacularly written book. It's, he it, it, it spent five years working on it. He actually, um, you know, it's interesting when you read the book, uh, you are reading when he took notes in his journal, um, he, he, he did, uh, as he walked along the trail, it was basically a he didn't have time to stop and do zazen which is meditation practice so as he walked he would pay very close attention to what was going on around him and that was his zazen practice so he, his his journals are actually basically you're reading someone's meditation practice and then when he wrote the book itself he had left his zen teacher because of a scandal in the sangha and blah 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 um and he treated the process of writing that book and going over the the, the prose again and again became his meditation practice so you're reading a book that really is someone meditating as they're writing or as they're as they're editing and and that just gives the the prose this absolutely kind of sort of uh transcendent quality um and to the point where actually if you when you read the book you'll notice that the book's broken into five sections and each section has you know a symbol at the start of it and it's actually the om mani padme hum symbol so you could even say as you're turning the pages of the book it's like turning a prayer wheel the book is a prayer itself um, so I think the, the people are just drawn to that book because it is so beautifully written and, and, you know, it's this, this story about somebody basically walking to Shambhala or like Shangri-La or something. It's this very kind of remote, romantic, 
uh, trek into the wilderness while he's looking for himself, while he's getting over his wife who's died of cancer. He writes about her very beautifully, um, not entirely truthfully, but uh, you know, that's a whole different story. Uh, he, there's a line in it where he says, he's talking about why their marriage was breaking down. He says, I behave badly. And my God, the, the, the caves behind that sentence, the caves and the caves and the caves, that one sentence sort of stands in for many, many things. Um, but I just think that the, the, the book kind of has many, many facets and it appeals to people for different reasons. Uh, and it's certainly something that, that every time I read it, I notice something different. You know, when I read it recently, as we were walking along, uh, I was I was reading it as we were going. I would read the, ch the chapters that were about where we were. And his comments on the physical landscape were fascinating because he would be writing about, you know, a, a grove of walnut trees that is still there in one day. But then another day he'd be writing about a trail that we couldn't find because it didn't exist anymore. Like the, the trails themselves were evolving and changing. Uh, or he'd write about a uh, a little a little village called Raha, which he called he called something slightly differently. But um, you know his description of the the effigies on all the houses, uh, we couldn't find them. So we talked to someone in the village, and we were like, "So where are these effigies?" And 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 Gavin James, you remember the 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 very kind of almost like uh, it was a young guy who we asked, and he didn't really want to talk about it. He was almost like ashamed of it. He was like super old superstitions or something. So you know, reading that book, we were able to kind of know something that wasn't there anymore we I think we did find one in the end but we were able to kind of ask someone and get an insight there that if we hadn't read that we I wouldn't have had any idea there used to be effigies on all the houses there um so so I really you know appreciated that element of the book reading it and seeing how how the landscape had changed uh, all the all the solar dishes that the solar panels and the the, the satellite dishes that are all through the, the place now and the blue tin roofs that got the selfies <laughs> <laughs> the selfies yeah my god the the every every place we go they want to get photographs with us it's very kind of interesting but yeah i do like the the sound of that a sort of layered way of traveling so not only are you you're moving slowly and you're building up yeah. relationships in real time but you're also you have this sort of past um trace of the previous journey so you can see it through time as well as through space as well i think that's a very yeah. interesting way of traveling and it, actually one thing that lan said earlier i was very interested in in i suppose the the artistic perspective that it brought this this idea of the distance between the daily um diaries the daily experience and and the product at the end um the way that it goes through iterative changes i mean uh, james is this something that you sort of recognize from filmmaking you know you 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 take a great deal of of film as you go but i i assume that there must be a sort of long stage of, of digestion before you reach the finished product is that how you would see it yeah it's, it's vast um a, f a friend of mine who i was um linking up with earlier this week says he thinks i must be sitting on some like lost vast hoard of stuff that never gets published and he's he's pretty true inevitably with these things you see so much and you, everything you see you want to capture and i'm sure i mean i haven't seen peter's raw um journal but i imagine there's acres of things in there that, that then don't make the final cut or are slightly adjusted or abridged and yeah it's definitely the same with filmmaking you you go through you experience everything you experience and then when it comes down to sort of presenting the finished product you probably show five percent six seven percent of what you've actually captured you know you, you come back with days worth of footage to make a one hour film um and in the process you do i'd like to think you don't like change the truth of what you're seeing but you definitely present the kind of the version that fits with the narrative and so i am sure within peter's work he was very much singing the kind of landscape as it was affecting him to the kind of zenith at that point of making it this really um spiritual place and it is it absolutely is um and his writing really targets that um but yeah truthfully too when you go these days you know you, you could you could create a film that would show the same thing but as lance points out at the same time you do have kids running up for selfies and sometimes it's actually quite difficult to not fall into the trap of ignoring some of the reality at, at wanting to present the kind of myth in your mind of what you think the place should be and that's something that I um I know other other filmmakers have struggled with in the past sometimes to kind of critique when they've been told that they're ignoring and you, and you can't sometimes but you try to ignore that cultures change and that you have this vision that things have to remain the same and so you end up 
effectively editing out some of the modern realities of what you're trying to show is this kind of like snapshot, pristine, I don't know, kind of spiritual life. Um, but to me, actually, some of that stuff is what makes it more interesting is seeing what has been taken on and what has remained. Um, and as Lance alludes to, you know, those some of those things are still there in what is a definitely very much more connected world these days. The fact that within a town, there are still people that hang dead crows from their roofs or have these spiritual effigies. It's, it's not gone. You know, some people have this sense that these things have been lost. They haven't. I think they may be a little bit less prevalent than they would have been once. But um, that's some of the richness of it. Um, and I always am trying to now be more conscious of not, you know, throwing that stuff out and pretending that it doesn't exist. It's kind of inclusive. Um, but yeah, there's definitely an, an, an a certain amount of editing that goes into these things and a certain amount. You definitely show the best, um, the best of the best of what you get. Um, yeah. No, that's really interesting, that sort of tightrope, I suppose, between reality and romance. And, and I think there's definitely a, a place for both of them in, in any work of art. I mean, um, just uh, there was a last minute question came through there from Linda Benkin, which I think would be best directed to Gavin, um, that um, dealt with rather briefly, if that's OK, Gavin. And um, we're just coming up to the end of the session. So I'll read it aloud. This is uh, George Schaller suggested that the people are poorly adapted to their landscape, not wearing snow goggles and getting snow blindness, for example, and that their farming slash grazing practices are causing erosion and exhausting the soils. What's your response to that depiction? Okay, I think I think there's, um, on the issue of, for example, understanding the weather and um, getting snow blindness and not wearing, I think one of the things is there's a mistake there and they, they traveled with people from the hill areas of Nepal. Um, the high Himalayan people really understand that very well. In fact, you know, when we take people up, we, we, we take people out with the Amchis who are the Tibetan healers. And one of the things I'll show you is how they actually use yak hair. They, put, they actually put yak hair around their faces as snow goggles, that's what they do. Um, so I think, you know, I think the problem is it's when you're taking people who aren't from the high Himalayas, they're more from the hill areas. You know, what we call, what they call hills in Nepal would be massive mountains here, but they're not as adapted to that environment. Um, what I would say is that, you know, it, there's, I think people are, from a trading perspective, they really understand. They have, they have tomes of books understanding weather patterns it's actually really fascinating you don't have time to go into that now but that, that's just a phenomenally interesting um you know uh, aspect of the culture of dolpa is their understanding of of and actually listening to animals you know when animals act strange they move out of the high areas because they recognize that animals sense the weather much more so the idea they're not adapted to snow conditions i think is i think is actually wrong in my in, in my view and i think it's a misunderstanding and I think it's a symptom of people taking people from the hill areas up in those high areas who don't understand it. And we actually see that with the Yasa Gumba collection where people come from hill areas and get into real difficulties because they don't understand the weather and the, and the weather patterns. In terms of um, soil degradation, um, I would say that that is very true in, in, in a lot of the hill areas. Um, in the high pastures, you know, one of the really interesting things when we looked at tracking was the local people were talking about the way in which they had defined for example the pastures how many animals could be on certain pastures for how long and when people were taking up um, pack animals from the lower valleys and actually allowing them to graze these pastures and go into the forest people were actually quite concerned about that so there was these local uh, these local mechanisms of trying to control um, soil degradation particularly in those high areas um, I think where the problem is much more in um, soil erosion has been in the areas where populations have increased much more, um, which is more the hill area um, mm. that is problematic. But personally speaking, I would my own personal perspective on this is that I think that's the, that's a, that's a misrepresentation of people, particularly of the high Himalayas and their understanding of how to how to live within that environment. 
Well, that's great. Thank you, Gavin. I think that might have to draw us to a close this evening. Um, we've had a, a great session there, and I think I've had a real insight into the journey that you went on together. So I'd just like to say thank you to Gavin Anderson and to James Appleton and to Lance Richardson for leading us through this evening. And for everyone who joined us at home, um, I hope you um, managed to take a lot from that session as I did. Um, so thank you very much. I'll hand it back to you, Gavin. Thank you very much, Carl, for your for your support, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we'll also be uh, cutting this together and putting it online. So it'd be great if you could tell other people to have a look and uh, and uh, find out more about this journey. And um, yeah, if you want to know more about nomadic skies, please look us up on our websites. And uh, um, and yeah, Carl's please Carl's books are fantastic. We're looking forward so much to. To Lance's uh, Lance's book as well, and I'm still in the process of trying to persuade Lance to come across when it's been published or even before to Scotland to get. You don't have to persuade me. I'm coming. It's going to happen. It doesn't <laughs> take much persuasion to come to, to to the UK. I love I love the UK. So watch this space. We'll, uh, we'll 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 do something live as well. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you, Carl, for hosting. Very much appreciate it. I'm looking forward to traveling with you soon. It's been a delight. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks very much. <laughs>